But murder doesn't just happen. Now, this scourge grows out of poverty. It grows out of hopelessness. For many, the deck is stacked against them from the day they are born. Broken families, struggling neighborhoods, poor schools, inadequate health care, no jobs. Frustration turns to cynicism. Misery turns to despair. Hope fades. Hate grows. Happy eyes turn sad. Seven, eight, nine years old. Smile turns sour. Bitterness sprouts. And in the end, tragedy triumphs. And there's blood on the streets. In a downward spiral, violence begets violence. The shooter of today is often, very often, the victim of tomorrow. I mean, the next day. And every murder leaves a wide wake of destruction, a very long line of victims, the collateral damage of gunshots in the dark. An innocent child loses a father, a mother's heart is broken, a family is left alone, and we are left to think about what might have been. That's what happened to Leonard Galman. Leonard's father was killed on the streets of New Orleans when he was four. His 17-year-old mother was left alone. Five years later, Leonard's life was turned again, turned upside down again, this time by another tra tragedy, Katrina. There were no silver linings in Katrina, but the wind, the rain, the fire, and the floods, <clears throat> waters also produced change. By the time Leonard was a senior in high school, the post-storm education reforms in New Orleans, which are dramatic, had taken root. He went from one of the worst schools in the city to one of our new charter schools, which had special focus on college. That has made all of the difference. With the help of his teachers, Leonard got all his ducks in a row and eventually applied to 10 colleges and universities. This fall, he is going to attend Yale University. That's good, isn't it? That's what I thought you would do. For weeks, Leonard's story was everywhere. It was the big story on the front page of all the papers. More articles, editorials followed. He was honored by the city council. He was honored by the state legislature. Congratulations and donations flooded in across the city, all because he showed us that there is hope, there's possibility, there was a pathway to opportunity. With help, even just a little bit of help, this young African-American kid did great things, as can all African-American men. But for Leonard, it was not as easy, not so easy, and we shouldn't ask any child born in America to bear such a burden just to get a chance at something more. Even the greatest among us would have a hard time climbing the mountain that Leonard climbed. If you want to know just how steep the path is for many of our young people, just go into ele any elementary school in a tough neighborhood. Ask a classroom of eight-year-olds a couple of questions. Ask them who lost a friend or a family member to violence. Ask them who had to run for cover from gunfire. Ask them who has seen blood on the streets, and then ask them, how many bodies have you seen? Can you imagine asking your children those questions? I don't think so. The answers our little children will give you to these questions will bring you to your knees. Leonard is the exception. He's not the rule. But there are two sides of every coin. And Marshall Coulter is the other side of the coin. In many ways, Marshall is a lot like Leonard. Both young African-American men from tough neighborhoods, both lost their fathers when they were young. Both of their childhoods were marked by Katrina. Like air, Leonard rose above it all. But Marshall fell like a rock. His first arrest came when he was 10. More run-ins with the law followed, marijuana, theft, burglary. Marshall would later be described by his brother as a professional thief. Then last July at age 14, Marshall got shot in the head as he stood in a stranger's backyard in the house that he was attempting to rob at 2 in the morning. He climbed over a tall fence to snoop around, opened a window storm, shut it appear in the dark house, but there were three people asleep inside. A man named Merritt Landry, who actually works for the city of New Orleans, his pregnant wife and his two-year-old daughter. It was Merritt who, awoken by his barking dog, grabbed the gun, stepped out the back door into his yard. What exactly happened next, we do not know. But in the early morning darkness, a warning was yelled out. Marshall made a sudden movement, and Merritt squeezed the trigger. After the shooting, Marshall was on death's door in a coma for weeks, but he survived. Meanwhile, Merritt, the homeowner, was arrested for attempted murder. 
suspended from the city of New Orleans pending the outcome of the investigation. But after the investigation, the DA declined the charges. One reason the DA decided not to move forward was that unbelievably, within months after leaving the hospital and regaining consciousness, Marshall was again arrested for another burglary. Think about that. Even after all he had happened to him, at the tender age of 15, he was stuck on a dark path, and we all know where it ends. In jail or an untimely death, another life wasted. So we have two young men, one likely gone to jail, the other one's gone to Yale. They started in the same place. So where did their paths diverge? When did hope turn to despair? And how can we help people, young men like Marshall, before it's too late? As one local columnist wrote, how can we make Leonard the general rule and not just the exception? Not enough investment and attention is focused on our vulnerable young African-American men. They think that we have forsaken them. And I have to say, in large measure, I think they're right.